this is Samantha Silver and today is May 4th, 2012 and I'm here with Effie at Occupy the Farm and Kristoff and we're doing a joint interview together. Um, so Effie, I'm going to start and ask you to spell your first and last name for me. E-F-F-I-E-R-A-W-L-I-N-G-S. Awesome. Can you spell your first and last name? K-R-Y-S-T-O-F-L-O-P-A-U-R. Awesome. Great. Okay, so Effie, I'm going to start and ask you some questions about your background. Um, so, where were you born? In Pasadena. Is that, that where you grew up? Um, we, I lived there in that area um, until I was, I don't know, uh, early teens, and then we moved to, we're in the Los Angeles area until, until that point, and then we moved to Illinois, where my grandparents lived, a um, small rural town there. They had a farm. So how did you end up in the East Bay? Um, I came here for school. At UC Berkeley? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When did you graduate? Last year, last summer. Cool. So summer 2011. What was your major? Social welfare. So, Christoph, where were you born? I was born in, uh, in San Francisco. I lived in California until I was eight, mostly in Davis. And uh, then we moved, when I was about eight, we moved to the East Coast. And I lived on the East Coast until, uh, well, with the exception of the year in Costa Rica and some summers in the Czech Republic. I lived in Connecticut until I went to college. So, when did you? personal involvement didn't really start until, um, why did become, I would have considered myself an organizer until maybe 19, maybe 2000, 2001. And what sparked that? Um, would have been the, you know, the impending war in Afghanistan and, uh, Israel-Palestine conflict, 2002. So do you see yourself as a part of Occupy Oakland? Yes, definitely. I was there from the beginning of Occupy Oakland. So, I mean, we, I was, you know, as part of the meetings that we had in terms of founding Occupy Oakland. And have uh, been involved ever since. All right. Effie, what about you? How did you first get involved in activism? Um, I think my personality lent me to be an organizer. love the earth clubs and going and picking up trash and whatnot and with my friends but um I didn't do political organizing until I think the Obama campaign and then I went and I knocked on doors in Colorado um and put my heart and soul into that and that was a very interesting and um enlightening experience watching then what happened from there and um being devastatingly disappointed in um, Barack Obama and looking for other ways of, of engaging besides the um, standard political system of voting in, uh, in, into power as people that don't turn out to have our interests um, or even be able to hold our interests as a priority. So UC Berkeley has a long history of protest movements. Uh, is that something that drew you to the campus? Yes, definitely. Yeah, uh, that's why I wanted to go to Berkeley was because I thought it was, you know, like the center of progressive thought. Yeah. So how did you how did you get involved on campus in student protests? Did you while you were there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I quickly learned. I think my very first meeting with my advisor, he told me about the cuts and the budget cuts, and I was like, whoa, okay, this is not the the place that I thought it was in terms of um, being some elite, like, deep-pocketed organization. Um, and so then just learn more and more about how that was impacting diversity um, of thought and of people that were at the school and um, where the, you know, just the whole privatization argument that it's controlled by those who can then give funding to the university, um, our education. And so 
really, really had some ideological battles with myself about that and started getting involved in organizing and then was involved in um, some of the direct action organizing in November of 2009, the first fall that I was there, and then just kind of like spiraled from there. So what has your involvement been like with Occupy Cal or the Occupy movement in general? When did that begin? Um, it began when I read about it in Adbusters, um, and I was like, it just resonated a lot with me, like the messaging that they, and the language that they were using, and... Um, and uh, <laughs> and I thought it was I thought it was hitting the nail on the head, like the way that they were talking about the issues that we're facing as a species. And so um, I thought, okay, this is going to be something big. And we're laughing because I called Kristoff, and I was like, this is going to be something. This Occupy thing is going it's going to be something. And he's like, whatever, it's not. And he'll tell you why he thought it wasn't anything. Why I was right. And <laughs> um, but it. Yeah, so from the time that I, I was I was an occupier from the time I read the messaging in, in Adbusters magazine, I feel. and But didn't really get involved until, uh, well, things started really heating up. I was in, I was in Dallas, and I, that's not my home. I was just visiting for like a month there and involved. And I organized a little bit with them, just a tiny bit, and then came back to Oakland and got more involved then. So, Christoph, what was your first response to the Adbusters? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, at the time, I had been organizing for a long time, like I said, I started organizing, it was very political, and I lived in a very political family, you know, went to all the anti-nuclear demos in the 80s, and, uh, and I started organizing right out of college, right after I finished college, right in grad school, and, you know, was a very political person before then. And then, so, you know, I'd had uh, the benefit of trying to organize for, what was it, you know, over 10 years at that point, um, when the Occupy sort of call-out hit, Effie brought it to me, and I thought it was really dumb, <laughs> and I th still think I was right, and the reason is that the call-out is really sort of, it comes out of the anti-globalization movement, which I was a part of. And it was still holding on to some of the really big mistakes that were part of the anti-globalization movement. So the Occupy call-out, um, the idea was that everybody in the United States would converge on Wall Street. Um, and as you can see what happened, I mean, I'm part of Occupy Oakland, right? It's not anywhere near Wall Street. The, the original call-out was San Francisco and Wall Street. Everyone goes to one of the two places. Um, and very few people actually responded to that. There were, there was a group of people, there's a type of person that responds to that kind of call out and went, but they didn't get the numbers that they expected. Um, and that was largely because of the way that the whole thing was being framed. It was very much to appeal to sort of the same class of person, sort of the same class of politics that motivated the anti-globalization movement, anti-corporate politics, um, and you know, all about messaging. So they basically said that, you know, we're going to camp out, we're going to get our message out there, and we're going to meet and come up with one demand, which was also, uh, you know, it's a type of politics that is really common. On the left at that point, I'd sat in maybe a thousand meetings. <laughs> no, I mean, no, no, definitely thousands of meetings, but like at least hundred, at least a hundred meetings in which people had started out, you know, hey, you know, introduce ourselves, and then the first thing we start talking about is what our demands are. And those are the most debilitating conversations ever. So I wasn't. I wasn't too psyched on the Occupy, the way it called the call out went, which was, you know, let's all go to Wall Street, you know, and obviously most people can't go because most people can't put their life on pause and fly out to New York and say, hey, okay, it's a new place I'm going to live for the next six months. Um, and most people, you know, and, and, and to do it, like, in, to, to basically meet with a bunch of people and talk about demands was absolutely ridiculous. And it turns out that you know, when those people started meeting, they kind of realized how ridiculous it was to try to come up with one demand. And the more and more time it took them to re out, figure out what they were doing there in terms of demands, the more they got away from the idea of demands, and the more this movement became demandsless, and the more attention they got, the more the media was sort of scratching its head. We don't understand this new thing. They, they can't say what they want. Who are they? What do they want? And then so, you know, that's when this 
that's when Occupy really took off. Occupy really took off when people abandoned this concept of a demand. They stopped trying to be the same as every other like pro failed protest movement over the last two decades had been. And and simultaneously, as they abandoned those demands, people were like, well, let's just do this everywhere. We don't need to just do this in New York. And they sprang up everywhere, and Occupy Oakland was a part of that. And that was, you know... So they, we were breaking from two of the really the key components of the original call-out. And when Occupy mutated like that, that's when it really took off. And that's when the media just went, went haywire. Um, everybody wanted to be part of Occupy. People started, you know, donations were pouring in left and right to all of these Occupies. Um, people were taking public space. And, you know, the authorities really didn't know what to do with it. And so, I mean, that's... To me, that's when the Occupy movement, the way that we really think of, started. It didn't start with the call-out and the initial people that went. And in fact, there was a real tension at the beginning between people who had been, and there still is actually, in, in Occupy SF and Occupy Wall Street, where, I mean, specifically where where these things started, because there's a core of people who went with those initial ideals and motivated by sort of those that initial set of politics that, that was put out. And they ended up clashing with the folks that came later, with the folks that were like, no, this is about our local city. This is about here. It's not about, you know, this broad anti-corporate message or this anti-Wall Street message. It's also about our communities. It's about our neighbors. It's about people that we live with. Well, because I think that's the answer to the, the globalization conundrum is, okay, well, how do we, like, feed ourselves? And if we, we have this economic system based on globalization, okay, well, the answer is for localized power and local and so, yeah, it makes sense that, like, it started out with, well, this is the problem, and then the solution is for us to organize together locally. So, I prefer to be part of the solution. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. Okay, so, great. So, we're here at Occupy the Farm. We're in, we're in Albany, California. And, uh, so... Albany. 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 Right. Albany. Albany. It's Albany. <laughs> Effie will tell you why, right? Yeah, well, that's why how, is that? That's how folks here can tell whether you really are from here or have been around here at all. If you say Albany, then you're not. If you say Albany, then you are. So do you live in Albany? No. <laughs> we've had enough Albany residents come through that, that we've learned. Yeah. And there are Albany people that are here all the time, too. Um, but your question was? My question is, how did it begin? Oh. Um, so about six months ago, uh, <laughs> this is like before Occupy, this is the germ, this is the germ of the idea. Yeah, no, the occupied germ was already seeded, for right. sure. Right, but this is the germ of this idea. Yes, this is the germ, yeah. So tell me about the germ. Okay, okay. So I went to, um, I went on a, on a road trip with, uh, three of my friends, uh, Bish, brother, and Yoni, and we went to the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center in Occidental, um, which is a couple hours north of here, and we went there because we wanted to have kind of like this visioning experience of thinking about farming, of uh, doing maybe perhaps collaborating on something together, and um, just get some inspiration. So we went up there, we hung out, it was amazing, it's a beautiful place, and on the way back, we were talking about, well, you know, that place is really cool, but it's so far out like, and so many people can't go out there and what if we had something like that in the city that you know people that can't afford <laughs> to drive that many hours either time or money wise could access kids could access it um, urban you know urban youth could access it um, what if there was something like that available in the East Bay um, and then we were like well none of us has any money for that kind of thing and we want to do it now while we have all this like passion and idealism and visions. Um, and so then we started talking about the idea of occupying space. And um, we were like, okay, yeah, but it would have to be something really righteous, like some land that was you know, in danger or threatened um, or something that was toxic and we could remediate it and da-da-da. And then on our way back, we passed the guilt tract. <laughs> and, uh, and it was recording. <laughs> and um, and yeah, I, I looked at the others and I was like, guys, that's our farm. And they were like, the kill track. Because like, everybody knows, everybody that's studied agroecology at Cal um, or is in the foodie kind of scene knows that the guilt track is this, this place that could be 
such an amazing resource for the whole community, larger community, and that it's not utilized in such a way right now, and, and is in fact in, in immediate danger of development. So tell me more about the Gale Tract. What's the what's the story with this land? Mm -hmm. Who owns this land? How is it, how was it used before you guys got here? Um, it's owned by the, the University of California. Um, uh, it's held in capital projects at this moment. Only. It's no longer owned by the University of California, Berkeley. Why? Because they don't own it anymore. Because it's it belongs to the project? people. Oh, well. We don't before like to say you guys that they got here, it. they run it. It is public land right now. It's held in I, the public trust. I think trust. they own it and we run it. I they like, don't own I think it. They're that stewards. <laughs> they are so they. The University of California is not a they. It's an institution. It's and the regents are they rotate. I mean, it's it's public land, and the University of California has been controlling it for about a hundred years. Yeah, that's true. They they bought the this farm from the Gill family. It used to be over a hundred acres. Went all the way down to the ocean. The Gill Tract Farm, um, and it was bought with money that was promised to be. was not used for that from the from the beginning. It was actually seized first by the US government for during the war. Um, it was fought around nineteen twenty eight and then yeah, seized and used for um, military uses for some time and then over the next uh, hundred years was progressively developed. Um, village housing, uh, UC Berkeley housing is here up up to this spot where we are now. And this is the last ten acres that we're sitting on. Um, and it's very, very, very unique in that in its ability to grow food. It's the last class one soil, which in class one means that it's just really fertile, not contaminated, very well aerated. It just it grows food really well. Um, and so in terms of food sovereignty, which is you know people's ability to feed themselves basically and control their food, um, <laughs> this is this is such an important resource. Again, going back to that idea of... This is Samantha Silver at the Gill Tract uh, on May 4th, 2012, and we're re-beginning our recording with Effie. Yes, um, we, were we were talking about the, the story of this place and, and why it's significant, why this space, why I occupy this farm. Um, and I was talking about the idea of growing food for a localized community. Um, and uh, so getting to this idea back to the original what we were talking about with Occupy which is you know localized power localized resources that's exactly what this farm represents and that's why it's an Occupy because how what more fundamental expression of community resilience can there be than, than us being able to grow our own food so um, this as I said this represents the most precious resource in the East Bay in my opinion um, because of its size and its um, the, the quality of the soil, uh, there's a lot of small parcels around that can help feed, you know, a dozen families here and there. But this one can feed hundreds, um, and it can educate infinity. So, you know, it, it has it has for, for educating people. Um, it's what half, you know, right between. and literally are really important and significant and worth something like this, an, an illegal occupation where we're all risking arrest. So what have your uh, interactions with the UC administration or with police been like since you've been here? Oh, no. um, it's been interesting, hey, you know, it's been really... Would it be helpful if we were like holding it up a little bit? I mean, I could even just. Hey, y'all! This is super obnoxious. People, good people. You know her. Obnoxious? They don't just—they don't know that we're doing it. Yeah. I don't know. say it's obnoxious. <laughs> You're like I'm not obnoxious. Just 
same nature. <laughs> do we need a second? Do we need to collect ourselves? <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm ready. Sorry. Okay, wait. So we were talking about the the, co the cops, right? <laughs> right, right. Okay, so. Uh, what is this? How the cops are treating us? What's their experience with the police been? <laughs> you mean now or just over the course of, of all the Here, Occupy yeah, movement occupy or the over the... At Occupy the Farm. At Occupy the Farm. Well, um, for the most part, the police have so far been pretty hands-off. Um, they've done what they typically do, which is... Um, or which, at least I should say what, what we've seen them do before in the past with this type of um, occupation. I mean, this isn't the first, obviously the first occupation at UC Berkeley. It's also, there was very recently, there have very recently been an open occupation at UC Berkeley, which is what this is where, you know, there's nothing stopping the police from coming in. So there's no barriers, there's no barricades, there's nothing, it's just open. Um, and what they've done in, in the past with these types of actions has been to come in and they read a dis well, it's a it's a, it's an admonishment. What they they call an admonishment, which tells people that here that they are breaking the law, um, and that they are uh, well. It's I mean, it's framed in legalese. It basically says you are trespassing and subject to arrest. Uh, you need to leave now if you do not wish to be arrested. And they basically do that repeatedly, and they come in, they read it, and they leave. The other thing that they've done is they've walked around a lot and um, just put their presence in intending to intimidate, making comments like, should we grab him, should we grab her? Um, and, you know, just wandering around the property, um, shining lights at people. They shine a lot of lights in. They come by at all hours of the night, and and... and I mean, they haven't done or taken any physical action against anybody on the farm yet. But that's, uh, they do appear to be preparing to do that. And I think that kind of like the, their presence isn't actually what's, mo what's most troubling. It's the way that, that they've been used um, as kind of players in this chess game by the, by the administration. That they, they sent them in, um, you know, the night before we were due to have these... Um, Negotiations, yeah. so-called negotiations, but it was actually just a you know exchange of information of concerns meeting. Um, they chose that night before when they knew that we were all trying. Well, I won't actually guess what they knew, but they sent them in the night before in unprecedented numbers um, and walked around our tents, talking to people. And again, as I was mentioning to you guys before, this was a time that. Perhaps they didn't realize this, but it was. I'm so proud of us that we didn't react uh, messily because there were some people suffer, suffering post traumatic stress from May Day events in Oakland the day before. Um, people having breakdowns, like, yeah, like severe trauma. We have to tell them about the baseball bat dude, too. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that, yeah, so their use of their their use of, of the police not as a law enforcement or peace officer sort of role but as this like again pawn to to intimidate us is troubling um not that i'm surprised well, but then there was this well, i was surprised though about this guy with the baseball bat well we should we should mentioned. add two more things i mean so the the harassment that we've experienced has been I mean, when we talk about the police, we have to have a bigger view about the kinds of things that police do. Um, they shut off our water, for example. Um, and when people have attempted to figure out how to turn it back on, the police show up right away. They shut off our water the day they were supposed to negotiate with... I mean, they were supposed to send people to meet with us. We had a meeting set up for the farm for 2 p.m. This is like the second day we were here. Instead of showing up, they turned off the water. Um, in, in an effort to starve the plant, to, to starve our farm of water and basically kill all the plants that are that are growing here. The second time we had a scheduled meeting, they actually showed up to that meeting. But the night before, they began an increased campaign of police harassment, which is what Effie's talking about. Is they came to the farm and they came in increasing, and they're coming in increasing numbers in an effort to basically intimidate the people that are staying here. And they time their visits for when they know that people have engagements away from the farm. So when like they have a community meetings. meeting, then a bunch of us will go to the community meeting 
and they'll come to the farm. So they, the remaining people here are traumatized. Or they'll come right after May Day when a bunch of people were just beat up in Oakland and those people will be traumatized. And the most troubling instance, and this is, you know, there's no proof or evidence of this, but um, a man with a baseball bat came into the camp and threatened everybody inside of the camp. Um, this is not... Okay, so this is not something that can be... Actually, I mean, it has been documented by police in general. We don't have specific documentation yet that the UC police were involved with this man. He came into the camp and he threatened to come back with a group of 12 vigilantes the next day and, and basically kick everybody off the property. And he took his baseball bat and threatened the people at the front info table and slammed it down on the, the table and walked away. <coughs> and the moment he walked off, the moment he walked off of the land, the police were there. The UC police were there. Like that. Two cars. Just out of nowhere. Um, like he walked down to the end of this drive, and as he was stepping off the property, there was two UCPD cars very, very slowly creeping up to the to the gate. And then, and, and then we followed him. We followed him with a video camera, and within a minute, he was arrested. Arrested. Um, I'm saying that in quotes because he was cited and released at the scene. And the way that, uh, that the arrest happened, again, that he came, he went, ducked into the housing, and then he came, came back out of the housing. And as he's coming out, the police car is coming from the other direction. Again, creeping very slowly, stops right in front of him. He walks right up to it, puts his hands in the air. The police come out, start reading his Miranda rights, cuff him, throw him in the back. There's like no like. They just. It was, grab it was this instant. guy, it's like it, and then it, they then they take make, they make to leave, and we're like, how did you know that this person was like? Yeah. What, how did you how know, did to you be know here? that he was there? And how, why, why aren't, aren't you, you taking our statements to anybody? You're arresting somebody for brandishing a weapon, but you're not taking any statements from the people that he's threatening with that weapon. And they said, oh, well, you're going to be here all day. We'll just come back, and we just want to get him out of here. And then they cited and released him. And the, the the log, actually, the UCPD log says male, you know, 35. Who didn't have his ID. He didn't and have so his ID, and they was. released him at the scene. They didn't have his ID, and so we're very we're very suspicious about the whole that whole incident. It's something the police have done repeatedly. And what the idea is 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 once you take and you liberate a space, you create a space where. Um, you're basically in contravention of some, you know, petty law like trespassing. What the police will do is they will try to create problems in that space and not police that space. Mm -hmm. As if, as Same if, problem. as if, oh, well, so now all of a sudden there's no law here. So you'll have your free zone and while you have it where every person that we come across that's drunk, every person that's, that's, that's 5150 or crazy, we're going to take those people and send them into the camps so that the people there have to deal with them and not only that we'll follow them closely and the moment anybody does anything we'll run in and arrest all of you right and then make a big scene and then the PR around it is oh you know these people are violent these camps are dangerous there's crime and so this is a this is a huge challenge for the Occupy movement and it's actually been, I mean, it's been documented in New York, it was documented in Oakland, and um, it's almost certainly going on, uh, it's almost certainly going to be going on here, or is already going on here, and, and it's, just, it's, that's the, the biggest strategy, the biggest, like, challenge with the police is not, is, is really not the stuff, it's not the legal challenge of being threatened with a trespassing citation, which is, you know, it, it's peanuts. Like the biggest challenge with the police is that they're uh, they're really function as an arm of the administration. They literally are an arm of the UC police. Belong to the UC administration, so it's like a, it's a bunch of it's a police department that is run by unelected officials. Okay, and these people uh, and and they use the police very very explicitly as a strategy for political control of the university and to suppress any kind of dissent at the university. And so, I mean, I mean, it bears mentioning that they do this on campus everywhere, and you've all seen the Occupy Cal videos. Um, 
but even even I mean even to a greater extent in a way people have more rights on a UC campus as a non-student than as a student and that's because the police officers also enforce the code of conduct which is more which is more restrictive than you know the law of California the Constitution so for example chalking if you chalk on campus a UC police officer will come up to you and tell you to stop chalking and to give them your ID now chalking is not illegal in Berkeley you're not doing anything illegal but there's a man with a badge and a gun telling you to give them your ID and when you do he's not going to cite you for chalking he's going to have the university write you a conduct letter so he's using the color of his authority as a cop to basically cite you to basically do the work of the university to do the work of the university administration because they don't want you chalking your political message so anyway these are uh, so, so like I said the, the, the basic point is that the UC police are a challenge and they're mostly not they're not they're not they're not they're mostly a challenge because they get fit into a strategy mm-hmm. that is the political strategy of the UC and uh, in a really cynical way that has nothing to do with enforcing the law. And I think that like that lawlessness that happens or that anarchy that happens in in the Occupy camps is really an interesting phenomenon because if it weren't for the necessity of this like shiny happy PR face I think it, it I think it's incredible for a group of people to rely on each other for everything and have to solve their problems the, the thing is is that these camps have an un um, an unbalanced uh, population of people with mental health disorders and um, other issues because it's open it's um, anyone can come at any time. No one can enforce anything. It's very accepting. It's very progressive. Like free food all the time. Like all of these things that just make it very, very accessible for anybody. Um, and if I, th- yeah, like I said, I think it's amazing for us to have to to deal with folks that um, are going through a lot of intense stuff um, amongst ourselves. And how do we do that, even though we don't have necessarily a degree that says that we can, um, how do we do that as people that just care about each other? And how do we find our food? And how do we do all this to take care of our health issues and all of these things? Um, but the problem is, is that our unprofessional uh, ism, our unprofessionalness uh, in dealing with those things means that we don't do it perfectly and that it, it just opens us up for criticism. And, um, you know, if we have, like, we had a woman here who had a rash on her thigh, and to show it to somebody, she's not, she's not completely stable mentally, um, to show it to somebody, she took down her pants and was showing this person. And this was right next to the art area where a lot of kids are. Now, there weren't any kids there at that moment, but the fact that then it could be turned and be like, oh, she exposed herself in the children's area, you know? This woman, this crazy woman, and here they are, like trying to say that they have this place. Wait, I'm not well, done. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, we're putting it. Okay, this is Samantha um, Silver. We're we're continuing with Effie and Kristoff at Occupy the Farm. Effie. Sorry, I have to interrupt. Okay. No, <laughs> um, so I was just talking about you know the 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 challenges that are faced within an Occupy camp and uh, basically an anarchist space um, are there really interesting and beautiful to see a group of people trying to deal with that amongst themselves in a, in a way that may oftentimes be more appropriate than some other like person outside of the community trying to come in and deal because there's people these people love and trust each other and when they're in a camp like this but the problem is is exactly what we're why we're afraid to tell you the story right now is because it it can be used against us like oh they've got this crazy woman in the camp um they don't know what they're doing that she's running rampant like Okay, the, this, this PR battle is, makes it so that we can't actually be completely genuine all the time. You know, we, we are trying to take care of each other and deal with things in a loving and accepting way. Because these people don't just go away, you know? Like, 
and if they have a community that cares about them and just trying to, to work with something, then I don't. I, I just don't know like what a more genuine and like authentic how we can create a more authentic world or a genuine world if we're not if we if we can't let communities work through things together and say wow they've really got a lot of crazy people in their camp because none of the rest of society is dealing with these folks and wow these people are and it's a mess because their ratio is like five to one right now of crazy folks and I shouldn't use that word but you know what I'm saying um and they're actually doing really fucking amazing with like taking that ratio into account I should say I don't know if I like how that was expressed. How would you say it differently? How would I say it differently? Um, Okay, so first of all, this is really different than a lot of the Occupy encampments. So one of the really brilliant things about the Occupy encampments and also simultaneously an Achilles heel, as as Effie pointed out, um, there's no like, you know, most of the Occupies, they're just, there's no... There's no entry requirements. There's no prerequisites. You don't have to pass a test. You don't have, no one has to vote you in or vote, no one can vote you off. So, you know, basically these camps had um, anybody could come to them. And in Occupy Oakland, one of the real strengths of Occupy Oakland was the fact that we did have a lot of people coming in who society would generally label as undesirable people who might have substance problems, people who, you know, might have criminal histories, people who, uh, people who might be troubled, people who, uh, uh, people who are, who have no place to live, people who are homeless, and these folks all actually, what you learn when you start, when, when you can no longer, when one of these camps did for a lot of people is it made it impossible for folks to ignore, um, you know, segments of society that they didn't interact with. So it's this is this crazy cross section in downtown Oakland. Like the you know that 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 block was the most diverse, most actually representative block in Oakland, and in every sense of the word. I mean, you had you had your you had your you had one percenters camping there alongside, and probably people who were one percenters or you know people who were relatively well to do camping alongside homeless folks you know you have you had drug addicts and 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 you did have you know uh, you have drug addicts and convicted felons camping alongside like you know ministers and and at one point you know city councilwoman and these that cross section was was brilliant and what i think people realize is that everybody has a set of skills that are really useful and a lot of the security in our camp was provided by people that had had experience, you know, conquering, fighting these challenges, people who were homeless, people who lived on the streets, who knew, like, how precarious that situation is, and how to handle themselves, because their daily life, their daily survival depends on their ability to de-escalate, whereas, you know, a lot of us who live in, you know, live indoors, a lot of us who have jobs, you know, we have options other than de-escalation, we can ignore, we can get away from those folks you know those folks that don't have those options develop skills that we would we would in our you know and you in your you know I'm not saying you I don't know who you are but you know people who are middle class people who are privileged never in their lives will ever be able to develop because they simply don't need them and and they're great skills to have so who's the best at de-escalation you know who's the best at living outdoors people who do that people who live on the street and so that's that's Occupy in general. This camp specifically uh, is a little bit different than uh, the rest of Occupy because we're trying not to have that open door policy. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is, as I sort of alluded to before, is that there is a huge media war component to this that we do require and we need a lot of support from people that just are not going to be comfortable if there's, say, drug use here, they're not, if, if, if there's crime, if there's, you know, pe- 
this is not we're not just contesting the space also we're trying to use it so whereas a lot of the Occupy encampments were contestations of space what we wanted to do was be there what we wanted to do is exist in front of City Hall just simply to exist here we're taking it one step further and we don't want to exist here what we want to exist here is a farm we want to be we want this land to be producing food and we want to be engaged with it but um, we have kind of a, a goal that's a lot more specific than what a lot of the occupies had and so we don't want people here that can't fit into into that goal if they can't work if they don't want to work if they need a particular service we're not providing those services we're not trying to provide those services we're not trying to be a place where people come because they need housing because they need medicine because they need health care because they need friendship companionship and all these other things there should be places like that and the occupy movement is a great venue a great way that people are providing that but this specific camp this occupy the farm it, it needs to be a working farm and if it's not those specific things will be used against it so if it becomes a shelter if it becomes uh, you know if it becomes a, a, a clinic a mental health services clinic or something like that then that will be used against it and everything that we've argued about with this is that this land is really special and that it's too good to be used for anything other than farming and so we can't you know we can't pr we we're kind of obligated um, and we, we want to be obligated um, our, basically our intention is our intention is for this land is to put a farm on it and nothing else in it and anything else would be a waste so that includes an Occupy encampment and that includes you know any kind of public service that isn't public. okay so tell me about the farming how has it been going what do you guys have planted I saw that you have different areas there was an art area with, for kids you mentioned or there were lots of kids there can you tell me about the different spaces tell on them, the guild track? Tell them about the candy corn. <laughs> we we planted candy corn. No, we planted candy corn. Okay, what did you really plant? <laughs> so what we... <laughs> that would be pretty dumb. That would be pretty funny if we had tried, wouldn't it? <laughs> that would be. That's I assume that's you know a little. Farming. That's farming. Candy corn, corn planting. Candy corn, farming. Pringles, and Cheetos. Yeah. <laughs> Hot Cheetos. What um, have you planted? Okay, so we've planted a lot. Um, we came in here with 15,000 starts, like on Earth Day, the first day that we came in. Um, those were grown by people from here to Santa Cruz in like little greenhouses. People were growing for us. Um, and so we loaded them all on a truck on the day and brought them in. Um, that includes like pumpkins and squash and tomatoes, um, lots of greens, kale, um, and then there's perennials over in the, the yeah. there's more than that that I'm thinking of right now, um, but there's um, perennial plants such as like aloe and berries, blackberries, raspberries, things like that, um, strawberries, there's all that action too um, over in the permaculture garden which is like it's children's garden slash permaculture garden. Um, and then we've also planted a few trees, um, some as wind block and some as um, kind of ceremony to put down roots here as well. Um, that happened last Sunday. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots of different things. And, and it was, it's not the like ideal because we were working on complete, like with no budget. It was all donation and seeds that we could get and where we could get and space we could get. So, it, like I said, it, it's not going to be, there's no grains, unfortunately, and, and things like that. But it's going to be amazing considering what we had to start with. Yeah. So who would you say, who do you see as the community that you want this farm to reach? Yeah, that's a really interesting question that we talked a lot about. Who is the community and who are we in relation and you know, we consider we definitely consider ourselves part of this community, although we don't live in Albany. Wait, that's um, not true. But well, we live in Albany right now. You and I don't. But like, I have been, you know, a bunch of the people who are part of this yes. occupation, if you will, do live here. Yeah, are, are that's so Albany true. residents. And another thing that should be said in terms of living, like this, you know, occupation is not meant to be an occupation. We don't want yeah. to. We don't want this to be like I said. I said that before, I guess. But we don't want this to be a camp. We don't want people living here. We want this to be a farm. 
and we're living here to defend it. We're living here to defend the plants and defend the, the land from the University of California. And if it can be guaranteed that this land will be a farm, we don't want to live here. And in fact, we don't want anybody else to either. So, but people but are camping fine. here now. Yeah. How many yeah. people? Yeah. Uh, Around? It's ten, it's ten, uh, 30 to 60 at any time. Yeah, sometimes more on the weekend. But um, the question about community is, yeah, like a really important one. And the way that I look at it um, is the kind of like bioregion for ability to grow food. So anyone who is in this bioregion, which I'm referring to like as the East Bay for ease, um, has, is a stakeholder in this because, again, going back to that community resilience, our ability to take care of ourselves, this is in, invaluable. I was just going to see if we could yeah. kind of make it away. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so this is an invaluable resource for the resilience of this um, local localized community which, yeah, as I said, we're, I'm referring to as the East Bay because I really think it's important that we think about those that are, are in food deserts in Richmond and Oakland when we're talking about where this food's going to go. Yeah, I want to comment on that, too. Go ahead. All right. Look, the, so the, the, this, is, this land is going to feed about, can feed about 250 to 300 families, which is nothing. It's small. Um, the people that are going to be directly fed by this um, isn't so much the issue as what Effie's saying is drawing attention to the problem, drawing attention to the fact that there are food deserts and there there is a real lack of self-sufficiency in our communities, and that that makes us weak, um, that makes us vulnerable, and that it, and it makes us sick, it makes us unhealthy and disconnected, dis reliant on like an oil driven globalized economy it's just pathological and in, yeah. in every way that you can possibly think of it's pathological and this is foreign to a lot of people it's foreign the concept of urban farming is foreign where are there farms in the cities this is now a farm in a city and the impact that it's going to have is not strictly through the food so the food is 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 important it's going to be used and distributed for free um, almost certainly it's going to be mo almost all of it will be distributed for free um, it will go out, and it will, um, and 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 so it will feed people directly. But the real benefit of this is, it, to, it there's a, there's another there's other benefits to the community. So you see these people walking out right now. There's a dad, two two sons. You know, there's some tons of kids are coming through here. It's gonna familiar, it's familiarizing people. It's familiarizing people with um, urban agriculture. It's familiarizing people with the you know where their food comes from. It's bringing people together to teach them how to do this. And the most important thing is that it's a precedent. So we want this established. We want this to be successful. And we're willing to make all sorts of sacrifices to make sure that it is successful. Because if this is successful, we will have been able to bring um, basically an occupy tactic, the tactic of doing something that's extra legal, of taking a direct action to the food justice movement. And everybody in the society knows that the, our food system is broken. Everybody understands that. I mean, you know, most people understand that the, the, most people's interpretations of that is that, oh, well, we should shop at Whole Foods and buy organic. But the real solution to that is to start growing your own food. And this is, you know, and where you can grow your own food. Nobody has any land. And so the point is that this is like the first direct action step that this can be successful. It sets a precedent where we can take this, if this can be successful, if this can produce food, we can take this as a model and replicate it in this community, in this direct, you know, in the East Bay, in the in the bioregion, and it can serve as a model for people all over the country, and it can serve as a, you know, as a, as a way for Occupy to actually do something with the land and the spaces that we claim that actually moves us towards, uh, towards that world that we want to live in. And I want to acknowledge also that this is, this is an example of how to do, um, and do something that others have been doing around the world, with Via Campesina, then the MST, this is just how we do it here, you know, um, or one way of how we can do it here. Um, because they've been reclaiming land for commons, for families to feed themselves for quite some time. Um, and they knew about this beforehand and sent us a statement of solidarity which we read out on the day um, which was a, a really
really incredible feeling to to have that uh, solidarity with those folks that are. I mean, they're they're doing it on a completely different scale. You know, people are getting mowed down with AK-47s. They're packing. Like, it's it's different, totally. Like, it, for us to co like consider calling ourselves landless peasants is a whole another conversation, um, which is not yeah. Like people and people are. It's interesting though because people are having those conversations. Um, the truth is though, and, that most people in the United States are landless, and most people in the United States could qualify as the working poor. I mean, peasants. Yeah, uh, I, it's just a, it's a, the, that word though is means something yeah, different to definitely. folks in MST and Via Campesina. So we're not uh, obviously not trying to use those I words, but add something oh, to please that. do. Yeah, I know it's very important. <laughs> uh, the hold on, what was I going to say? What was I going to say? Um, uh, the the other thing is we should probably be clear that this is not the first time in the U.S. that people occupy land. final statements last words all right great <laughs> thank you <laughs> oh good that was like quite an effort credit teamwork guys keep getting that recorded getting that recorded <laughs>